Hey guys, Sunspan here with Cinder from Dota Cinema, and this is a new series we're going to start doing for the XMG Captain's Draft Invitation, where we take a specific match and talk about interesting things that happen in it, and perhaps it will help you guys learn exactly how the pros play, of course. Cinder is going to be joining me for this amazing series, and take it away, Cinder, as this is the Alliance vs. Navi Game 3 in the best of three that was played not too long ago. Yeah, so we're, we're going to jump right into this game, Alliances and we picked this game for a couple of bad. reasons. One of them being, of course, the draft. In our tournament, the draft is, as in every tournament, the draft is really important, but uh, the thing about Captain's Draft is that the teams have very short time to analyze the pool and really figure out what's going on and, and adapt to it. So now the approach we're going to take here is that bad. we're going to start looking at how they do the first phase of ban. So we see Alliance, they're going to ban out Pudge. And the Enchantress, pretty much, the Pudge is a targeted ban at Dendi. And then we have the Enchantress ban, which both teams actually really like to play. When we start looking at the pool in the left-hand side, we see there are a lot of push-oriented heroes. There's Pugna, there's Enigma, Shadow Shaman, Alliance we have Juggernaut with the Healing Ward, pick. we have the uh, Abaddon, a sustained pushing healer, and in that category we also have the Viper. So um, Navi, on the other hand, they're going to ban out, they're going to target their bans against what Alliance played earlier in the tournament, namely... Naga and Nightstalker. And this next pick, which of course we've been over beforehand, uh, not to, again, this, this is going to spoil some things in this video if you haven't seen the match, but if you haven't seen the match by now, come on, you should see it by now. Uh, this <laughs> is a normal pick in all for all intents and purposes, but for this specific pool, it actually ends up being a terrible pick. And of course, we'll go over the details of why that is, but Lifestealer is the first pick for Alliance. And there, like you were talking about, there are so many good push years and at the same time, a lot of great counters, such as the Viper with the ultimate going through Rage, um, even Beastmaster, his roar, and all that good stuff. Uh, and another hero, which you didn't mention for pushing, which I, I will spoil this, is not picked, and it hasn't been picked this entire tournament for whatever reason, is Troll Warlord, a very underrated pusher in that's his true. own right. He is also available, that's very right, and one that we will spoil will get picked is actually Sniper, who is... A really good pusher in the sense that shrapnel, of course, deals damage to towers and that you have really long range, so it's hard to stop Sniper from pushing if he has a good front line that defends him while he's able to push. So we're going to see how that comes into play now. For now, we're going to get a little bit into the minds of the of the two teams here. So Alliance first picks the Lifestealer. Navi are using two-thirds of their total time for covering the two bands and the first two picks. So they really they want to get a duo here that sets up for the rest of the draft for them. So, we're going to see them now. They're going to be picking up the Abaddon as well as the Viper. And there's a couple of things Alliances to note about these. So, first of all, pick. we talked about how this pool is very pushing and, and teamfight oriented. And secondly, they get the sustained support in Abaddon for the heals and for the Aphotic Shield. And most importantly pick. about Aphotic Shield, it removes open wounds, which is arguably Lifestealer's most important. It's his only ability that allows him to lock on his target, else he's dependent on other slows. So, in that sense, Abaddon a great counter. And then you have the Viper, of course with the Viper Strike that you also mentioned before, really great ultimate against Lifestealer. Yeah, and they haven't picked it yet, but they're going to pick, again, this is spoiler, spoiler alert, they're going to be picking Pugna <laughs> here with the Visage, and I think in a lot of ways this was kind of a panic pick, because they see what Navi's picking, they're like, okay, they're going for a lot of sustainability, there's still a ton of pushers, I mean, Navi, even if they wanted to, they probably would have to, I mean, even if they didn't want to, I should say, they'd probably still end up picking a pusher, because there's so many in the pool, it's kind of hard yeah. to avoid them at this point. So they're going to kind of panic here with the Pugna, which of course is a good pick, and he's a great pusher. They Navi think Navi might be going for him, pick. which they might have, who knows at this point. Um, but right now, I mean, looking at this, that is a very scary try lane for Alliance. Yeah, it's obviously they could potentially run that. I, Whenever I see Pugna, I always think either the carry in a try lane or the farmer or a solo. This hero needs levels and or farm. It's just mandatory. I think it's a really terrible hero if it doesn't get Navi's that. But yeah. turn to pick. Just to finish off on the Pugna pick, I wouldn't necessarily call it panic as much as I would call it forced. I think that's a different remaining. thing. You panic when you're like, oh shit, we have to pick. But Alliance, Alliance they know what they're pick. getting into. They know the other pushing heroes in the pool that are worth thinking about are Enigma and Shadow Shaman. So those two heroes also have really high monocle Alliance's spells. So Pugna is kind of multi-purpose. They pick it to guard themselves the best they can against those two strong intel pushers, and at the same time, they don't want to give Navi the whole package. So, I remember when we cast the game, we were actually Five talking about this, that remaining. Alliance probably had to pick it, and they did. Um, so they read the situation remaining. the same way. So Navi are going to transition from that. They see the Pugna. They might have wanted that. It's likely that they wanted it. And they're going to get the Bristle back and Enigma instead. I guess we should pause the replay now so we stay on the screen here. Absolutely. Um, 
So they get the Bristle back as well as Enigma. The Bristle, they want to have a, a useful offlaner. This is, was another thing about this pool of heroes. There's actually not that many good offlaners, so Bristleback gets very high value in that regard. Um, so they're going to get that. It's also a great hero for Funnig in general. And then they get the Enigma together with that. So Navi, again, putting emphasis on the sustained push and the ability to stay in fights. Both Bristleback and Viper, backed up by an Abaddon, are really hard to deal with. And it just goes to show, I mean, this kind of Navi's, I'm not going to call it their flavor. It kind of is their flavor overall. I was going to say flavor of the month, but it's been like this forever. They just love pushing, flavor they love the aggression. Two years. For, yeah, flavor of their life, basically. But the Bristleback <laughs> is so perfect because they can just dive tower. I mean, it kind of kills two birds with one stone as far as being a tanky hero that can dive towers and, of course, the side lanes. So their lanes are actually looking pretty decent. Sniper mid is kind of meh overall, but of course, if you're going against a Pugna or a Shadow Shaman in this case, um, doesn't have to worry too much about that of course neither of those heroes have escape mechanism and of course going over alliance uh, the pugna is going to end up being a solo of some kind the question is where i mean their lanes are kind of weird overall and i think it's the side lane that's the weirdest because uh, let's say you have a shadow shaman mid with the the trial of life stealer visage and ventral spirit which is very good in its own right but then pugna is off randomly in another lane you know so we'll see if they end up switching that up but uh yeah the, um, the one thing I want to add about this is exactly, just to add to what you're saying about the tr uh, about the potential trialing from Alliance, they don't have a jungling support like Navi do. So Navi will be putting the Enigma jungle, it's obvious, especially after Puppy picked it, that that's what they're going to do. Uh, but Alliance don't really have any good jungling support, they don't have something like a Crystal Maiden or the Axe that we've seen them playing earlier in the tournament, or a Chen or an Enchantress, something like that, it's not available. So. Alliance are, I wouldn't say forced to run a tri-lane, but they've kind of picked themselves into a situation where it seems like the best choice. So the two tri-lanes they can run are either a tri-lane with Lifestealer, Visage, and Venge, or a tri-lane with uh, Visage, Venge, and Pugna. And whichever they choose, they're going to have to run it aggressively because they don't have an offlaner. Navi got the good offlaner in Bristle, and Alliance hasn't picked one for themselves. They could have got Tide or Beast if they really wanted that, but... Again, in this pool, how good would they really be for the the kind of game we're getting into here? So, with that in mind, Alliance will want levels on their Pugna and Shadow Shaman. From a strategic perspective here, they will should be easy laning one of those and mid laning the other one. And then they will run an aggressive trialing with a Life Sealer, probably. Um, and that is indeed what we are going to see when we get a bit further into the game here. As you can see, we are now in the laning stage, three minutes in, very early, and despite that, there's already been two kills, separate kills, I should say, at the top lane, which we'll talk about in a minute. But for now, let's just go over the lanes in general, which we have in mid, as expected, Sniper versus the Shadow Shaman, which is an interesting matchup, to say the least, considering neither of them have any escape mechanisms, but they don't really care about that right now, because it's just a 1v1. Bottom lane, which I was talking about, or alluding to, I should say, in the pregame talk, where... Pugna would be kind of weird in a side solo situation, especially if you're going to be against a Bristleback. Who, I mean, you have Decrepify, which kind of counters. I don't know if I want to call that a counter, but it's obviously amazing against physical damage, which is all Bristleback does. But of course, that's only two seconds worth, and you slow yourself. So if you're having to use that to try to survive against a Bristleback, you've probably already lost. And then top lane, the Tri V Tri, or Pseudo Tri for Navi in this case, we have Visage, Life Stealer and the Vengeful Spirit for Alliance, going against the Viper, Abaddon, and Enigma in the jungle. Yeah, this, this trialing up top is going to be really interesting, and as you can see on the screen right now from the kill score, what's interesting about this is that Navi are playing a pseudo trialing, and Alliance are playing a real trialing. Venge has been moving a little bit around, but technically is part of the lane. And still, Loda has one-third of the farm Havos does. So Navi are effectively playing kind of a two against three here, because Enigma hasn't been involved at all, and they're still out farming Alliance. So what's interesting about this lane is that the way Lifestealer generally dominates the lane is by using the open wounds on the enemy when he comes in close, so there's always the risk when you're trying to farm that you get caught out and then you get killed. But the thing in this case is that and we're going to see an example of that in a moment in a play, is how Abaddon and Viper combined are ridiculously hard for this Alliance power lane to actually kill. So even though they have two slows and a stun from Venge, it's it's still not going to be, um, to be an easy task for them in this top lane. So from a strategic point of view right now, the mid and bottom lane, effectively in terms of farm, are pretty even. Uh, but the top lane is really what it's where it's going to be at right now. And we're going to have a look at an example right now. Here we are three or so minutes later, and you're going to see the power of this tri-lane go to work 
on the Viper who is seemingly alone here. Gonna start with the Grave Chill into the Open Wounds, but here comes Kuroki, and this is what we were talking about. The Aphotic Shield is just so good against all these spells, negates all that minus move speed, and as a result he gets away despite it being a 3 on 2 and even a 3 on 1 at the beginning stage of that. So what's interesting about this is that they start off with the Grave Chill into the Open Wounds, and Kuroki holds on to his Aphotic Shield for so long, so he doesn't just jump in and use it immediately after the first or second slow. He waits until everything is applied, so after the Grave Chill is on, after the Open Wounds is on, then the Magic Missile comes and there's the Aphotic Shield. The important thing about that is Alliance have to commit their abilities in succession in order to bring down the Viper, and the Aphotic Shield needs to remove as much as possible, and the way Kuroki uses it, he not only removes the stun, but also the remainder of the Lifestealer slow here, and that's what keeps Hervost alive. So the reason we're highlighting this play is that this kind of style for Navi's lineup is what's going to be really important later on. But first off, we're going to jump to the next play where Alliance actually get themselves in a really good position. So now we've skipped a little bit more forward and uh, there's been a couple of more kills in particular for Alliance who managed to take the top tier one as well. And now they're going to take the mid tier two, uh, tier one, sorry. So... Um, of course, Alliance with their Pugna as well as Shadow Shaman have a really easy time bringing attack. down these towers when they get in position. And now they've managed to take two tier 1 towers before Navi get their first one. So if we look at the gold graph, they're about 2,000 gold ahead at this point 10 minutes in, which isn't an amazing lead, but it puts... When the, with the type of lineup Alliance have, you could be saying at this point that they're in, a, they're in a pretty good position to start sieging more towers with the hero composition they have. But now something really interesting is going to go down on the bottom lane. Here we are, not too long after, and Dendi and the rest of Navi is going to be attempting to push this tower, but Alliance is going to attempt to defend it, but as you guys can see, there isn't a whole lot they can do. I mean, take aim, level 4 on Dendi, Viper, last Radiance hit, very strong. We're actually going to pause it right here because I want to talk about this. Despite Alliance not being able to defend this, and they're going to be backing up as much as they can, the threat of Enigma, which a lot of people talk about how great his black hole is, and even though it's on cooldown right now, Alliance may or may not know that it's getting pretty close. So chances are they don't have that down to the exact second, but uh, just the threat of the black hole really is Enigma in a nutshell. And you have Funic being very tanky, can take a lot of damage. Dendi in the back being protected thanks to the zoning out of Puppy and Funic, and of course Kuroki with his Aphotic Shield and Mist Coil can help people get out of sticky situation. And of course, there's Hobos being completely useless um, down here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's interesting here on 1820 is the way Navi put their heroes in relation to the lane. So if you look at Alliance, they very wisely have Visage and Shadow Shaman below the tower. So they're in the woods area where Navi can't really catch them out. They're very fragile and their abilities are high of high value at this point. So. For Alliance, only Loda can front line. Everyone else is fragile and can get burst down really easily. And then you look over to Navi's side where you have Viper and Bristleback as two frontliners on the lane. So they're kind of creating a wall for Dendi to stand behind. If Alliance want to get to Dendi, they have to get through Havost and Funic, Or they have to wrap around and go from in the jungle. But what's the problem is that Puppy is out here causing pressure. He is... Showing himself, he's hitting the nether ward from the side, and Alliance can't really commit on Puppy because Kuroki is standing next to him ready with the Aphotic Shield, and Navi can then turn and uh, fight back to, onto them. So Kuroki is kind of in a position where he's guarding Puppy in the side and the heroes in the lane at the same time, because the heroes in the lane will not need help immediately, Puppy will, but Kuro will be in time to get in and help, and the amount of raw tankability that Navi have and how they can use that in the fight is really crucial here for the fight to not even break out. The interesting thing is Alliance are ahead on gold and they are probably feeling okay in terms of their ability to fight. I mean, they have a great team fight. They have a Shadow Shaman at Pugna. Um, they also have high levels on the... Um, yeah, they have high levels on the Nether Blast. Loda has Infest and EGM has Swap also already, so they have the tools they need to fight, but they just don't even get to. And we're going to transition now a little bit further forward now to the Roshan fight, which is going to be really interesting. Here we are at Roshan. Once that tier 1 tower was destroyed at bottom lane, Navi, of course, went towards the Roshan, as is pretty normal when you have map advantage like this. Loda's going to attempt to scout things out, along with his friend, Admiral Bulldog, who's going to place a nether ward here. 
And Aki's even here to place the sentry, but it's going to be too late. Funnick is going to get the Aegis pretty much immediately, but will fall right afterwards. But that's not too big of a deal for Navi because he's still extremely tanky once he comes back. And look at all the abilities that are going to be used to help Loda survive, who almost goes down right off the bat. But of course, all the sustainability and the amazing black hole from under the cliff from Puppy is really what turns this around. Kuroki does die, but really the survivability, tank ability of this team really shows in this in this fight. Okay, so at this point, let's have a look. Navi just came from the bottom lane where they took the tier 1 tower. And as you can see, they have planted a ward for the occasion. They want to take Roshan, they cross from the bottom lane towards the pit. So they place a ward close to the rune spot that not only sees that area, but it sees any sort of area alliance could come in from apart from above which they don't really need because they pushed out the mid lane already. So this ward is is securing the Roshan area for them unless the lion smoke it. So alliance are going to show up too late. As you pointed out, Puppy gets a really good position here. And this is interesting because in most cases, you will see teams just all chasing up the cliff here, chasing up to get, get the fight going. But Puppy wisely spreads out here from the fight. And there's two reasons for that. First of all, this is a very unusual area to get a black hole from. Secondly, it's a shorter path to cut off the Alliance heroes because Navi feel like they're in an advantage here, chasing up in the diagonal from the bottom right towards the top left. So when Puppy cuts through the river, Alliance's escape path running towards the top uh, mid tier one is going to be cut off by Puppy. As long as Navi feel like they're ahead, he can do this. Another point is, when he splits off from the team like this, he's a high-impact teamfight hero right now. And when he's spread out, he's less likely to be controlled by all the stuns that Alliance have and their teamfight abilities. So they're going to be firing. If the fight breaks out, they're going to be firing Ether Shock, they're going to be firing Nether Blasts and stuns and whatnot, and Loda is going to fight whatever he can in this area. When Puppy spreads out from the team, he knows that he has the tanky dual core running, <laughs> dual core, running along there, together with Kuroki's Abaddon, so they can't really go on either of them. Dendi, once again, is just running from behind with the sniper, and then Puppy gets the flank angle that he needs to set up that fight so beautifully. So, we're at a point in this game now where Navi have just, after being a little bit behind, they took a tower and they took Roshan, so it's starting to even out now. But when we see how the fights develop, you would imagine that at this point, Navi were going to start just going one lane after the other and taking the towers, but that's not going to be the case. So now that we're 14, 20 minutes in the game, not a whole lot has happened since the last transition. The top tier 1 has been taken out by Na'Vi, and this tier 1 is going to be traded, thanks to Alliance's amazing push power, but they're going to continue to push from both sides. Of course, both have fortifications up. Alliance has a lot more pushing potential thanks to the Rasta Wars, which you can see coming to effect here. But I think the important thing to note here is, despite having a lot of great utility, in their lineup for team fight potential. Alliance is really avoiding team fights at this point, mainly because of how fights have gone so far from what you guys Radiant's have seen. Top tower and has the interesting thing about this is that this is actually forcing Navi back. They're going to be the first to blink in this game of Dyer's chicken, if you will. And they're going to be forced to team fight. Or I'm sorry, they're going to be forced to, to TP in, and Alliance is just going to avoid them at all costs. Yeah, so ab about this fight, when we, when we backtrack it a little bit, or not really this fight, because we didn't have a fight develop, but the interesting point is when you look at Alliance's lineup, they have so many powerful abilities. They have Nether Blast, they have Ether Shock, two massive AoE damage abilities, lots of lockdown and slow stuns, whatever. They have tons of teamfight utility. Then you look over at Navi's lineup, they have a Black Hole, which is awesome. They have Malefus as a stun, and that's kind of it. Obviously some slow from the Viper as well against the Lifestealer, which is going to cost him living hell. But apart from that, in terms of control, they don't have so much. So what's interesting about this is that even though Alliance have so massive teamfight potential, they can't really execute it against Na'Vi. And um, considering that Na'Vi is dire and they've got Roshan, this is obviously going to play an important role because when they have the Roshan map advantage, whenever Roshan spawns, Na'Vi will go there and if Alliance can't fight, it's basically going to be a free Roshan every time. So we're going to move forward now. We're actually going to go 10 minutes forward because the, the game from, that, from this point on it's going to revolve around a lot of split pushing and a lot of tower pushing, but then at one point, Navi are going to get what they want. Alright, so now we've skipped forward 10 minutes and we're now 27 minutes into the game, and as you can see from both the gold and the experience graph, Navi are gaining a really significant advantage. And what's interesting about this is that they're one kill ahead and the towers are even, so it's 5 to 5 on towers, 10 to 9 kills. But Navi have just been finding more farm and had more control of the flow of the game. A lot of it, of course, attributed to the Roshan. 
and uh, the things revolving around that. In the middle lane, Alliance see that Navi have two heroes pushing the bottom, which is Viper and Abaddon, so they think they have a chance at ganking mid. Now, immediately, Puppy comes in from the side with a side of Vice, and Alliance are basically caught off guard, so they're gonna immediately lose EGM, and then they're gonna transition over to Bulldog. And now at the same time, S4 is going to escape and try to TP bottom, but it's going to be a really long TP and he's going to be too late. And now Loda ports in. Looking at bottom lane as he ports in on the live you're seeing how much damage he can actually do with the Abaddon there is next to nothing. He's going to attempt to do a little bit more to Kuroki, but with the Infest and of course the Kuroki's ultimate going off, it's just not, no kill's going to happen. Fodok shield off every other second it seems like. So the bane of Lifestealer's existence is, is Viper and the Aphotic Shield from, from Abaddon. So what uh, Navi just accomplished here is they got four kills out of it, where it was... They are definitely in a, at a significant advantage in this game, and now they're going to be sieging the base. So I want to pause really quickly right now and take a look at one thing we haven't really touched upon just so much yet. So when we, when we went over the fights earlier with the wall, kind of, that Funic as well as Havost are creating with their Bristleback and Viper, Dendi can go for a really greedy item build, as I like to call it. He doesn't have a single defensive item on the Sniper, bar maybe the Blink Dagger, if you will. So he's gone from Mask of Madness, a Yasha, and straight into a Daedalus. So he has a thousand hit points. He's a very fragile hero, but in this kind of game scenario that Navi are playing, because of the kind of wall he has and the hero composition Alliance has, they have a really hard time getting in on Dendi. Now, it would be a different story if Alliance had, let's say, a Storm Spirit instead of the Shadow Shaman, so they could bomb in the Lifestealer and just catch Dendi out. But because Alliance don't really have any sort of very powerful initiation mechanism, apart from the blink into Hex by Shadow Shaman, and then they could do a bomb with that, Dendi knows that with any sort of advantageous position here, he doesn't need a single defensive item. So the only thing he gets is a Blink Dagger. And that means now that Navi, granted, they are ahead by a lot of golden experience, but Dendi are, is converting all of his gold into really solid damage output. And that means as long as Navi's front line doesn't fall, they can just push these towers really quickly. What did Funic build? He built a pipe to assist them in that push and the team fight that Alliance have. So, to recap a little bit, we're 28 minutes in. The Lifestealer position one hero for Alliance that they invested a lot into has a Heaven's Halberd only, together with Face Boots and Drum, which, of course, are a little bit, but not really big items. He was forced into Heaven's Halberd, he needed the evasion, and he needed the disarm against the, the heroes of Navi, but Loda simply can't fight. And we're gonna see that in this final base push when Navi just exert their total dominance of this game and completely crush Alliance here. And here we are on the final push of Navi versus Alliance. Puppy's gonna initiate with the Sheepstick, which is a really good item choice this game, and it's actually his main choice in items, mainly because you're going against Vengeful Spirit, and the utility of that is just out of control. And once they get the advantage, they just right-click away to victory, as I'm going to go to 2x here. We're going to watch Dendi, just right-clicking to his heart's content. Of course, playing an extremely greedy build, as Cinder talked about. And he does have a magic wand, so there's a little bit of defensiveness there, but not a whole lot. But considering how much zoning ability they have, and he can just sit in the back and right-click, it's just really no issue for Navi to take over this game. And you're seeing Alliance try to defend to the, to, as much as they can, but really, Lifestealer getting picked off right off the bat ensures the death of two racks. And as you can see, the GG's will follow very shortly. But really, this game is a very interesting game in the fact that the first pick is really what what this game came down to, Cinder. And actually, I'm going to show the end screen because it's broken <laughs> in VOD for whatever reason. So I'm going to close this, and here you guys can see. Navi won. Big surprise. But I really feel like, and again, it's not Alliance's fault completely because this is Captain's Draft. You're not used to the the pool in general. But Lifestealer first pick against this team just turned out to be an absolute disaster. Yeah, there's a couple of, of really interesting things about this. Um, just to wrap up the thing with the Enigma first off, the, the whole... What I loved about Navi's... Navi's game plan here, so to speak, is their itemization. I think it really shows how well they understood what kind of game position they were in. So like you point, like we've talked about already, the greediness of the sniper build, um, and then the way Navi distribute their items. So they went for the mechanism on the Viper, which you usually see on Enigma, but in this game it makes so much sense to have it on the Viper because he's a frontliner, he's always in the middle of the fight, he needs the tank ability against the Alliance heroes, he's a great mech carrier. So, okay, Enigma doesn't have to get that one then he could either get a blink, like you mentioned, or a BKB, but if he doesn't catch Venge in the black hole, it's going to get stopped by a swap anyway. So instead, Puppy goes for a 
an unusual build with Hex first. And the reason this is good is we talked about earlier how when he goes in the front, he's kind of, um, it's the threat of the black hole coming that's almost as important as the black hole itself. When he has the Scythe of Vice, he has two types of initiates. He has the Malefice and the Scythe. And when he tr when he moves in, you can just see Alliance's heroes back out because they don't want to take the fight already. And if Navi have the initiation and the advantage because of that, it's even worse. So when Puppy has the Hex, he starts off the fight. And the following wave that comes in is a Bristleback who's unkillable. It's a Viper who's unkillable. And then an Abaddon who's keeping both of them topped off and healthy. And if Alliance try to fight back, they walk into this wall where Dendi is just hitting super hard behind. If they don't, they lose their base. So, like you said, Lifestealer turns out to be completely useless for this type of game. And the beautiful thing about it is that if you look at the drafts isolated on paper, Alliance has a great pick. The, their, their game plan, the draft makes perfect sense. They have great pushing, team fight. They have what it takes to end the game. They have good lanes, all of it. But it just, with the game plan Navi has, the way it's executed and the way they put their lanes, Alliance were kind of playing against time here and eventually didn't manage to accomplish enough because they couldn't fight and their split pushing wasn't effective enough. So really a game that, although it didn't have an amazing amount of kills, just in its own right, it's really exciting just for the, for the strategy itself with how Navi managed to, right from the start in the draft, counterpick Alliance along the way and then take advantage of it in the game using the Roshan to their advantage, using their team fight to their advantage, and then eventually just winning the game. And with that, we're going to wrap up this series. Let us know what you guys thought. This, of course, is Sun Sand and Cinderin. And I want to give a big shout out to Ake and Puppy, the only two players that are not using Smurf names right now. So great job, guys. <laughs> Love you. <laughs>